for you two. Phylum chordata. We talked a little bit yesterday that that means they have a noto cord. So we should probably start off by discussing uh, what the crap that is. Any yeses, any takers, no toe cord? Mm -hmm. Is it's either the dorsal or the other nerve cord? Well, right? it's it's definitely on the dorsal side, but it's not the nerve cord. Dang. It's not the nerve cord. Is this a bullet or a Ask again, five dollars. Is that the uh, like bone around the nerve cord? And us, yeah, it's a bone around it, but it's not necessarily a bone. It is, however, a nice, stiff, supportive structure, runs up the dorsal side, and it's used, its purpose is to help with locomotion. Now, in vertebrates, things with, you know, bones and stuff, it's been turned into a vertebral column. So, yeah, we have bones, but there are some non-vertebrate chordates, right? You saw those in the book, yes or yes? Yes. Yeah. So you saw the ones in the book that are non-vertebrate chordates. So in those, it's just a nice stiff support structure. Usually it has on or near it the dorsal nerve cord. So everything we've looked at so far has a ventral nerve cord, yes? Yeah. We talked yesterday how we've got that dorsal nerve cord, and that's not great because now it's like, you know, we can't really protect it. Yes or yes? Yes. yes. And then on top of that, the nerve cord is superficial to the notochord. That means it's closer to the skin, closer to the surface. So the dorsal nerve cord is not being protected by the notochord like at all. The notochord's job is to give support, right? Think of, think of even your backbone, right? You don't maybe necessarily think about it because walking is something that you do so often. But it takes a lot of muscles and a lot, all those are tied, all those muscles in your back are tied to your backbone to help keep you right upright, walking around, stuff like that. So the notochord is to help out with locomotion. As everything else in bilateral, we have bilateral symmetry. We also have, what's exciting, a post-anal tail. What does that mean, post-anal? Where do we find the tail? On your back, by your butt. By the butt, before or after the butt? Before. What's post? After. Oh. After. So the post-anal tail, this means the tail grows after, right, it grows beyond, so it's found after the anus. Which means the anus is not the most posterior end. See, oh, post as in posterior. So everything else, right at the end of the tail, that's where you find the anus, not in phylum chordata. I heard like when babies are like embryos, they have like tails and that at that point in development they can be anything, like it just depends on the DNA being given. So like, how does that work? I mean, any of you can be anything if you believe in yourself. Aww. No, Mr. P. Like and subscribe for positive vibes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have a tail right now actually. Oh, yeah, the t it's like this big. It's not very exciting. Like some of you, it's like this big. It's not very, yeah, the tailbone. You have a tail, and that's an example of what we call a vestigial structure, right? Something that's evolved and it no longer has any function. Also, a lot of biologists call that an evolutionary legacy, right? It's left over from evolution and it's not doing anything. What is definitely doing something in you right now, though, we have a ventral heart. Now, in in the everything we've looked at so far, where's the heart been? Oh, um, ooh, post and uh, I can't remember. Just give me dorsal or ventral. It's been ventral, hasn't it? Five dollars. Oh, I thought it was ventral. Oh, T-bone. Dorsal. Dorsal. Yeah, the heart's on the dorsal side. In fact, remember the crayfish? That heart was like almost where you get a tramp stamp tattoo, right? <laughs> dorsal, super superficial, right on the edge. Right, we flipped it. We took the nerve cord and put it on the back, and we took the back heart and put it on the front. So we pretty much completely, this phylum has just reversed the, the internal structure. So the ventral heart, which now I like because now, right, if something's going to come with my heart, which is, you know, pumping that blood through my body to carry oxygen and nutrients and other stuff, right, that I need to survive. So now I can, like, block and be like, no, you, get shot. you can't get in my heart. Uh, block the bullet with my lightning fast hand. Yeah. Also, like everything else that we've been looking at recently, complete digestive system, which means we have two openings in the digestive tract. 
What else is interesting though that's found only for, and specifically for phylum core data, pharyngeal slits, which sometimes look more like pouches, sometimes look more like slits, and you, pouches, in some things, slits. What structure or what organ do you think has these slits in it based on this word right here, pharyngeal? What's that look like, Connor? Pharynx. The pharynx, that's right. They've got slits in the pharynx. Pharyngeal slits. Did you write down pharyngeal? It's kind of tricky to spell. Don't forget that Y right there. Pharyngeal slits or in you, pharyngeal pouches. That's right. You've got a tail and at some point you had little pouches or arches in your pharynx. Here is a picture of my friend and yours, a very basal chordate. This is called a cephalochordate or a lancet. A what? Or a tunicate. What the heck is that? little non-vertebrate chordate. Notice we've got the notochord is here, right? So it runs down and gives good attachment point for the post anal tail and the muscular segments, right? Helps with a brand new dance now. Yes. And then again, see, the nerve cord is superficial to the dorsal or notochord, right? The nerve cord is outside, on top of, not protected by the notochord. You see what I'm saying? Here's a nerve cord. Those are all up to a nice brain. That's why they're called a cephalochordate, because brainsies. Here we have the mouth. Why would we need a mouth and pharyngeal slits in the pharynx? What do you think they use these pharyngeal slits for? Many of them actually don't use them like gills for breathing. Most creatures that have functional pharyngeal slits, which is fun to say, functional pharyngeal slits, most of them with functional pharyngeal slits, they use them for filter feeding. Food is in, right? Water comes out, food stays in, that sort of thing. How big is it? Notice again, ventral heart. Ventral heart. Here is the intestine and the anus and the tail post-anal, right after the anus for the tail. How big is this thing? That big? Do they have eyeballs? <laughs> uh, some of them do. Yeah, they, like some of them I've seen with a complex eye, a little like appendages out here. So is this like a type of fish? Chordate. Yeah. <laughs> fish have fish have skeletons. These no, these are non-vertebrate chordates. Here's a pretty distal chordate, though. This is yourself or someone like you. What? This is a human embryo developing in utero. Oh. This is taken with like an electron micrograph. And you see these right here? Boop, boop, boop. Head, hands, and feet. What? Pharyngeal slits. Did you need to filter feed when you were in the womb? Yeah. yeah. You did? No. No, where'd all your food come from? Mom. Transfer from mom. The umbilical cord transfers all the nutrients in. Your mom does all the digesting. That umbilical cord basically hooks right up to her bloodstream. When she's getting the nutrients out of her intestines, you're getting the nutrients out of her intestines too. How do you get oxygen? Are you breathing with some weird hybrid gill system? Umbilical cord. No, you're getting it from the umbilical cord. You transfer oxygen, CO2, nutrients. In fact, there's a, you even get rid of most of your waste through that umbilical cord. Wait, where does it come out then from the umbilical cord onward? Into the bloodstream. So our moms were pooping out our own crap as well. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh come on! Mom, mom literally did have to do everything. You know, for I never thought about that. That's I In fact, it's really bad if you were to try and breathe, even with the lungs. If you were to try to breathe in that, like, it's full of amniotic fluid. Like, it's not good. You're going to suffocate. Right. So everything. Everything that you need and needs to be taken, it's all through the umbilical cord. So these, again, vestigial trait, evolutionary legacy. Leftover just shows our lineage, shows that we've inherited this trait because of our common ancestor with all other chordates, but we've evolved out of its function. Here is not really a cladogram, but sort of like just sort of cladogrammy looking thing. Placoderms. Check this out. We share a common ancestor with the echinoderms, right? And you saw like the, the brittle stars in the video, right? They stick out their arms and they just like, man, like fi filter feeding. So we have some kind of filter feeding, arm feeding echinoderm. <laughs> then we've got uricordata and cephalochordata. See that little sucker right there? No. Right? There's, there's what I was showing you, a little cephalochordate, right? 
And then up here, once we've got to vertebrae, right, now we've got bones. So here, these are non-vertebrate chordates. Everything above here now has bones, now has bones. Which means once we get bones, we can get jaws, right? We can get bony skeletons, or you can go shark mode and make a skeleton out of cartilage. Flexible. It's more like the cartilage in your nose, though, than like the cartilage in your ear. It's not that floppy, but it's, it's, it's not a bone. Not a bone. They also have teeth on their skin instead of scales like a normal fish, because sharks are terrifying. Is that why their skeletons aren't left behind that when they decompose? Like yeah, the cartilage will break down. That's why their skeleton is not left sharks. behind when they die. And then, check this out. We get up here, right? We can get amphibia, right? This is a good transition species getting on the land, right? They, oh, yeah. In fact, where do their larvae live? Water. In water, water, right? So amphibians, they need water and land. They get reptiles. That picture, that's all wrong, because that thing is a freaking bird. It goes up here. Also, had feathers. Nope. So you got reptiles, right? We added scales and like this box-shaped egg. And there's some evidence that some of them may have been like sort of warm-blooded, like able to maintain their body temperature a little bit more. We got birds that are totally able to do it, and mammals like us that are totally able to do it and have mammary glands to feed the young. Hey yeah, because they said that dinosaurs were diclassified. There were those like Velociraptor more closely related to birds, mm -hmm. and then there were ones more closely related to reptiles. It had something to do with the hips. Hips and the feet and the bones. And the mouths. Birds. birds. However, everything below here, everything below here, how does it, how does it reproduce? What do they have to lay? Eggs. Eggs, right? Oh, what's happening? Eggs, right? Oh, everything here's got eggs. And these all do eggs, right? Mm -hmm. See, we're talking about the eggs here. Guess what? Mammals also, some of them lay eggs. That's a group of mammals called monotremes. This would be hairy. Perry the platypus. Jeez. Not ah. on a table. Also the echidna, which is way cooler. And then you've got marsupials and placentals. We're all placentals. We've got the internal extra pouch, right? So the embryo can develop and the fetus can like have nutrients and protection right inside the womb. However, marsupials, they don't have that. And so the fetus, not even a baby, the fetus all furless, blind, naked, the whole deal, has to crawl out of the womb, crawl through, crawl across the mother, and get into an external pouch to hook up to get the rest of its nutrients as it develops and turns into a baby. Basically, a lot of them don't make it. Most of them will end up dying. I made it. Well, you're a placental. You've got a, you've got a lot easier path. You're not, just a little bit you're not a kangaroo. Or, or, a, or a Tasmanian tiger, or the one that you probably see that most people don't even realize is a marsupial. Awesome. A possum. A yeah. possum. You see these outside? They eat ticks and stuff. A possum? Or just a possum. Um, Spelled like, opossum. When, when they have more than one baby and like you need the, they, they need the umbilical cord to eat, mm -hmm. how does that oh. like, work? Like, it's like a competition. Or multiple cords. That's because okay. cam marsupials only have around like one baby at a time. Um, depends on the species. Kangaroo. What about a cat? Kangaroo, I've only ever seen like awesome. one joey getting in there, but I'm not sure off the top of my head. Don't they actually call like kangaroos? Cats are plus side posts yeah. like we are. That's great. Either way, we're going to look at amphibians in a little more depth because here are some amphibians, and we actually we have back in that bucket we have some tree frogs and we have some bullfrogs. Oh, other amphibians, other amphibians that we're not going to dissect are including, but not limited to, the toad, the newt, and my favorite, the salamander. Salamanders are awesome. They're amphibians. Now, bia, you should recognize as being the feminine version of which root word? Bio. Who wants Trevor's points? Bio. Bio, very good, Liberty. So bio... Living life. What's amphi? What's amphi? Usually you think of its other version, which is ambi. Didn't think about that one either. You should know these. Otherwise, I think I'm going to have to add a question to your final exam, which is all 135 root words. The definitions. Well, 
but if you start studying that, that would be the time to look up the root words. We'll wait. Feel free to fast forward, just scrub through this because, like, my class doesn't have their act together. Class, especially plus Jaden, who is not even attempting to get well, I his might even, words. Oh, wait, I probably have a mic. You just see them. Yes. Yeah, right. oh, I'm looking. Actually, Trevor's got it. And Fear and B. You got it, Trevor? Both. Both or who wants Trevor's points? Ooh! <laughs> Both. Both or? Sam, you sneaky. Around. You sneaky. What? Around? Like Ambien. <laughs> Both or? No. Oh, I think I know. Double. Both or double. That's Both awesome. or double. Oh so, wow. they live literally <laughs> the double life. The double life. They're There's like at least one kid watching this on YouTube just like screaming out like, it's double, it's right there on the screen, what's wrong with these kids? Freshmen, that's what's wrong with them. Oh, wow. I'm not hey. freshman. Double life. I'm just. I'm just joking. I love freshmen. Yeah. I shouldn't have said that. Riddle me this, bad children. An amphitheater. An amphitheater. Is it inside or outside? Outside. Both. It's both. It's both. Never mind. Amphibians. Do they live on land or on water? Both. Both. Yes. Very good. That's why they're called amphibians. In the larval stages, they use gills to breathe, so they are aquatic. They need to be in water. Ted, larval yes. stages need to be in water. You should be writing this down, by the way, still under core data. Probably you should have written class amphibia already for the capital A, because that's how we do when we do proper nouns. Right, Lydia? What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the adults, though, they have lungs. So the larval stages are aquatic. The adult stages, some of them are more aquatic than others, but they've got lungs. So even the ones that are living in, on, around water, spend more time in water, like a whale or something, they're going to have to come up to the surface to breathe air. Now there are several salamanders that maintain their gills in adulthood, because they're weirdos. But for the most part, this is how it works with amphibians, double life. However, both of them, see, both amphibia, both of them require moist environments. Most of them need to get wet, need to stay wet, need to be near, in, on, around water. Caden. Um, my old biologist teacher, when I went to East Knox, they had, uh, he had a, a salamander named Salvador. Okay. Uh, and I think he said he found the outside and it was yellow on the body. Is that like a special type of, he just spotted the yellow. Sounds, sounds like a salamander. Oh my how, God. If they wow. need to stay in moist environments, how come, like, I often find salamanders in pieces of wood in the middle of dry summer. Like, literally in pieces of wood. Uh-huh. In a nice, wet, rotting, decomposing piece of wood? Depends. Probably near a riverbed? No. Uh, quite a few, quite a few feet yards away from the creek. <laughs> well, that, that's Several super yards. close. You're kidding me? Feet yards? Come on. <laughs> that's super close. It was exactly. It's pretty good distance. Five yeah, point nine six, six yards. Six yards. Okay. We'll go back to the river one. The diameter. All right, look here. They're also cold blooded, so they have no ability. They need to stay wet. They cannot maintain their own body heat. In fact, they can't even do homeostasis like we can. We have waterproof skin. I don't have to get myself wet all the time, you know, only for cleaning purposes. I'm not gonna like dehydrate <laughs> if I don't just cover my whole self in water. I will I? In fact, as long as I drink some fluids and don't talk a whole lot, right, <laughs> I could probably go a couple days without water and be just fine. I go home and I sit in the bathroom. Not so, not so much for the amphibians. Now, the reason why their skin is not waterproof is because unlike reptiles, they lack scales. Reptiles have scales, it's waterproofing. Even the way that our cells lay on our top layer of skin, it's kind of scale-like. They also don't have claws. So they don't have claws, they don't have scales, they need to be in, on, and around water pretty much their whole life, also definitely for reproduction, and they can't even maintain their body heat, so my question is, how could they possibly live? They sound kind of wimpy. So far, not impressed. Nope. Is it about the yellow black salamander again? No, it's not about the yellow black salamander. It's about the black and red. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so, uh, I see it. Can you... Be, like, can you grow and like, have scales as a human like, can't do like, a disease? 
Yeah, scale disease. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean there, there is grayscale, I guess. I was just thinking that. <laughs> no, uh, the closest thing would be like if you have like uh, eczema or something like that, your skin gets kind of scary. Yeah, you got eczema. <laughs> yeah. also, there's also <laughs> another type of disease, but I cannot think of the name because it's too much. There's also, yeah, you're going to miss like four or five minutes of your next class if you guys don't focus here. Alright, so when they feed, when they feed, this is important. When they feed, right? The tadpole larva, they use those pharyngeal slits not as their gill system, they use those to filter feed. They're herbivorous, right, they're going after algae, little broken up pieces of plant, stuff like that. However, the adults are vicious, gnarly, hungered predators. This voracious, that basically means they don't ever feel full. And they're not picky at all. Here's the decision tree that a frog goes through to decide if it's going to eat something. Is it moving? Does it look smaller than me? If the answer is yes to both of those, the frog is going to try and eat it. Does it move? Is it smaller? I'm eating that sucker. And when it does it, it does it right here. Look at that mouth. Look at that mouth. Now here it is, the tongue coming out of the mouth. It's grabbing like a big old horse fly looking thing. What do you notice? Where is this tongue attached in the mouth? Where is the tongue attached in the mouth? like on the lip almost. Yeah, the, in the front of the mouth. Our tongue is attached to the back, right? Mm -hmm. Which means no matter how far I stick out my tongue, I can't stick my whole tongue out of my mouth. They can. Whoa. What? In addition to that, it's got little appendages at the end so it can sort of like grab stuff. So the tongue, right, folds out like this, grabs on, then folds back, and now look, the food's already right there in the back of the throat. Ooh, yeah, all How nice far? and all nice and ready to get eaten. Like, How far can their tongue stretch? Depends on the species. Not as far as in the cartoons. Oh yeah. But look, still, still, look. This is way farther than these little stubby arms could reach, right? Yeah. Right. So they can still, they can like whip it out, like rah, like this whiplash motion, rah, stick the food in there, and then they're gonna shut their mouth. They're gonna swallow it whole. No chewing. Usually, it's still alive. Cool. Is that why some frogs to come back? Because I want to make sure that we get through. Is that why some frogs eat other frogs? Is it smaller? Does it move? <laughs> yes. Depends on the species. <laughs> yeah. Any, any, in fact, they're young. They'll eat their own young. They don't care. Is it smaller? Is it moving? I'm eating it. The parents will eat their own tadpoles. If it's smaller and it's moving, I'm That's eating it. Said, How could no. they? Because yeah. they are hungry. <laughs> now, in order to see all the mouth parts, this is what you're going to do. So you're going to come in. Looks like tomorrow. You'll start off with your scissors. And you're going to stick, you, the mouth is going to be kind of stiff, so you might have to use your probe to pry the mouth open a little bit. And then you're going to stick the scissors right in the car or the rock. And you're going to cut your cheeks. And you're going to cut it all the way back. And then you might have to two hand it because you're going to use your scissors to cut the, the jaw bones there. Whoa. It's going to crunch. You're going to hear it. Oh, <laughs> that's cool. Right? Feel free to ask it why it's being so serious while you do that. <laughs> Wait, what do you say? I missed it. What then, did you say? Then you're going to pry its mouth open. Like, Look at my hands here. You're going to pry the mouth open like to that. So again, there's going to be more bone crunching. and Just be kind of rough with it. Pry the mouth open. When you get that open, you'll notice right away the tongue attached in the front. See those two appendages we talked about for grabbing food? Uh -huh. You also will notice on the top of the maxilla, right, the, the top jaw, they have what's called maxillary teeth. They're tiny, you probably won't see them, they're going to feel like rough sandpaper. Fish have these same kind of teeth. I was going to say, yeah. Do they kind of look, look like layers? Very small. If you look close enough, they kind of do look like teeth, but they're kind of transparent. You look close enough with a hand lens, you might see them. But how, they, how it's designed is they're set up to like sort of interlock with ones down here, mm. right? Waterproof seal when they shut their mouth. Oh! Which means, can food get out once they shut their mouth? No. Yeah. Not so much. Now, what if it's a really big, strong, meaty prey? Then they've got right here these vomerine teeth. What? And when it shuts its mouth, it's got big prey. These two vomerine teeth, they're hard, they're pointy, crushes it to death. Or crushes it into submission, at least, because usually it's still alive when it gets swallowed. So you have the tongue, it's throwing the food back here towards the back of the mouth. These teeth are crushing it. These teeth are sealing it in. The only escape down this back here, which is like a modified pharynx, we just call it a gullet. 
What that means is it can expand really big. How big? Just about the whole size of the throat. I want you to imagine if you could literally swallow something almost as big around as your whole like neck. Like a snake. Whole, like a whole burger. Ah. Is, that, is that an adaptation that snakes also share with you? Uh, snakes have a similar like a structure, yes. Like that, I'd be, I'd be Are we going to be able to see those two? Two? No, wait, wait. There's more though. There's more. You'll be able to see all this stuff in the mouth. On top of that, you see these big like pockets right here? Uh -huh. This is my favorite part. When you're dissecting, you're going to put like your finger right there on the pocket, have your lab partner close the eyes for you, because what you're actually going to feel, you're going to feel the eyes push against your finger there. What? So they shut their mouth, they've crushed it with the vomerine teeth, waterproof seal, they already thrown it towards the back, the tongue's like pushing it down the throat, and then on top of that, they shut their eyes as hard as they can, and they push on the prey with their eyeballs to shove it down the gullet. What the yeah, they're devoted though. Yeah, this is why they're successful. They don't need claws or scales or what have you. They put their eyes on their prey to eat them. They're vicious. That's not worth it. Some of the other things. Some of the other things that you'll see in the mouth. Right, you'll also see on either side of the vomerine teeth. On either side, you'll see the internal nares. And there's a word that's similar to like nostril. If you put your probe through there, you'll actually find the nostrils, which are like right at the tip of the nose part, but they're pointed up, right? Our nostrils are pointed down, right, because we live on land. We don't want rain getting in them. Their nostrils are pointed up, right, so they can just like, they're, in the, they're underwater, they're hiding, they're doing their rehydrating, do their thing. They just stick their nose up out of the water. Right, take a big breath, go back down. That sort of thing. Cool. Additionally, you'll also see right here and here, these are called eustachian tubes, with an EU for true station tubes. Eustachian tubes, you have these. If you uh, were to destroy your eardrum, you could actually push through your eardrum into the very back of your throat. No thanks. Right? You ever notice, like, if you yawn, right, you yawn, or like you swallow sometimes, and your ears will pop? That's because you have those eustachian tubes to balance out, equalize the pressure, so you don't like blow an eardrum. Whoa. Right? So you'll be able to stick your probe in the eustachian tubes and gently push, and you'll be able to find the tympanic membrane, aka the eardrum. Whoa. Which is on the outside of its body. Wait, what? So it hears things. What is it listening for, other than like predators and maybe prey? What is the frog primarily going to be listening for? Mating. Yeah. The love song of its potential mates. This structure right here, this is called the glottis. G-L-O-T-T-I-S, glottis. You have one. It's what lets you make like the Tina gra like the Tina like groan. What? What's the Tina groan? Uh, <laughs> oh, the oh, oh. That's how they that's how they make the ribbon sound, which means this hole here in the gullet, that goes esophagus and stomach. This one right here, that's the glottis, that one goes towards the larynx, the trachea, the lungs. So they can breathe right through here. This is also how they can like make their, this is like the version of their vocal cords kind of. Whoa. Right, this is how they focus, well it's more like how they focus the sound. Right? So those are mouth parts, yes. So every single time a frog is making a noise, it's only for mating, right? Just about. Some Man. frogs scream. That's a lot of meaning. Yeah, some do. Outside the aisle sometimes? I mean, you gotta, you gotta, yeah, everyone does. You gotta let them know you got the good gametes. Great. All right, when you open up the frog, you're gonna see a myriad of complex organs. You have the same kind of organ systems that we have. In fact, look at this list. You'll notice in their digestive system, they have like exactly the same organs we have. They're almost the same shape color and they're in the same position as they would be in our body just about. So you got the esophagus obviously and then the stomach and for the first time look small and large intestine not just one intestine to rule them all. They've got a small intestine that's going to help with a little bit more like a uh, um, chemical digestion but primarily what is the function what is the role of the small intestine? That you keep getting wrong on all your dissection lab reports. What's it called? No, the intestine? 
<laughs> not digesting. All right, so ooh, we, ooh, we put ooh. the food in, no, we break I it know. into smaller bits. How do we is. get it? Absorb nutrients. Absorb nutrients. Write it down real big across everything that is on your desk right now. Intestine equals absorb nutrients. Real big, right at the top. Put it on the frog paper, put it on your cladogram, put it on your like dumb math homework that you thought I didn't see. What? Write it real big. Should I put intestines or small? Intestine is for absorbing nutrients. The small intestine especially does a little bit chemical digestion, but it's mostly absorbing nutrients. Large intestine will absorb a little bit more, but mostly this is sort of like a holding tank. We're going to reabsorb liquids, gases, and just like in us, they've got a whole bunch of bacteria helping them break that waste down before they try and get rid of it. The other thing that's fun, they've got a liver. It's in three lobes over top of everything, just like in us. And they have with it a gallbladder. Oh the point of the liver, as far as digestion is concerned, is to make a really nasty chemical called bile. That bile is a really, really toxic, gnarly, like melts everything kind of chemical, specifically designed to help digest lipids, fats. It's a ton of energy in lipids. But they're really hard to break down because it's a really dense, heavy, hydrocarbony molecule. Bile is for that, and the gallbladder's job is just take all the bile that the liver makes and hold it, and then send it on down when it's time to break up some lipids. Which means, where will you find the gallbladder? Where are you going to find the gallbladder? Close to the stomach. Close to the... Uh, Liver. Liver. I bet you're going to find it like pretty much on the liver, on the underside of the liver. Don't worry, it's all been drained. What is the last one? Then? The last one I was getting to. <laughs> it's called the cloaca. And the cloaca is a structure that's not found in mammals so much, but it's definitely found in amphibians and reptiles and birds. Now we've got separate openings depending on what kind of waste we want to excrete, yes? We've got a separate whole tract for liquid waste and solid waste. But think of bird poop, is it liquid or solid? Both. It's both. It's both because there's only one hole for all that stuff to come out. Oh. Including but not limited to all the gametes as well. There's, they just have a cloaca. So gametes, waste, that's liquid or solid, it all comes out through one hole of the cloaca. So they only have two openings. So it's a poop pee hole. It's, it's, a, it's a, all the hole. It's a, it's, a poopy, it's, all it's a poopy whole gammy it's a, a Five hole in one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> On top of that, they also have a respiratory system. Then they can do gas exchange through their skin. So when you first start cutting it open, you want to look for all the blood vessels in its skin. Because they can actually, this is one of the reasons why they need to stay wet all the time. Their skin's not waterproof, but that also means it's not vapor proof. So they can breathe through their skin. We can't. We are for. We have to take gases into our lungs to do gas exchange. They don't have to. They can do it right through the skin. Like albino. Sort of like sort no. Sort of like the earthworm. <laughs> what? So basically, they can have their both their head with their nose and mouth under water. But if they just stick a leg out, they can breathe through what? that. Well, they can also just do gas exchange with the water. Ah. Uh, Wait, what? Yeah. So they, so they have their nostrils for like breathing through their lungs. But they can also do gas exchange with the water they're while they're under. Oil. The water they bother coming up so there, man. Man. Well, because food. Well, so you There's can't drown a frog. What's that? So you can't drown a frog. They, you oh. could, but it'd take a while. <laughs> it'd take a while. Uh, they also, remember, yeah. larval stage of gills, adulthood, they have lungs. They also, like us, have a chambered heart. Well, they were cage, right? Yeah? Underneath the rib cage. Now, in order to really understand this whole chambered heart situation, we got to talk about our heart first. Does anyone know how many chambers we have in our heart? Ooh. How many chambers in our heart? I see you, Connor, but I'm trying to, do it like, I'm trying to get somebody other than Connor to have 20 points today, like maybe Brandon O. Give me a number. How many chambers? Yes. <laughs> How big? Four. We have four chambers in our heart. Fifty would be awesome. Fifty would be awesome. But we only have four. Now, what a, yeah, like you knew, shut up. <laughs> now, here's why we have four chambers. You look here at my nice, badly drawing. Right? We have lungs, and the job of the lungs is to do gas exchange, right? You've taken 
the oxygen to your body, your body's taking that oxygen, sent to the mitochondria, mitochondria did cellular respiration, made a crap ton of CO2, the CO2's in the blood now. We don't like that, that's not good. So we send it to the lungs, right, to get rid of it. We trade the CO2 for more oxygen, yeah? Yeah. Now, would you want to be pumping blood around your body that's rich in oxygen or rich in CO2? Which would you rather? Oxygen. Oxygen, oxygen right, it's the whole artery vein situation. So veins, right, for the most part, the veins of your body are returning to the heart. It's taking it right here into the right atrium. The top ones are called atria. The bottom ones are called ventricles. So the right atrium is getting blood from the body. See how it crudely says from body there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it basically just goes like a little cup and pours it down here into the right ventricle. Now already you're looking at it, you're like, how come the right ventricle is on the left? Wait. Shut up. <laughs> at the worst possible moment. Because look at me. This is my left. This is my right. This side, that's right. See what I'm saying? From ventral view. There's, so this, the job of your right ventricle is to have some nice strong muscles to pump blood into the lungs. So we pump blood into the lungs and through the lungs. They do their gas exchange. Then they come here from the lungs into the left atrium. Everybody with me so far? The left atrium has a little check valve, basically pours it into the left ventricle. And then the left ventricle, see how big and meaty it is? See how it drew it way bigger? The left ventricle beats really, really hard, sends all that blood through the whole body. There's also a reason why people think that your heart's on the left side of your chest. It's dead center. You can be feeling on the left, because the ventricle is the bigger on the left. Right, this is the bigger, stronger muscle, so you feel your heart beating on the left, but it's really dead center. On top of that, if you listen to the heart, you'll hear lub dub, lub dub. A little beat and a big beat. Lub dub, lub dub. You can hear, you can hear the right ventricle pumping blood through the lungs, and then the left ventricle louder and stronger pumping through the whole body. This is important because, again, we want to keep the oxygen and the non-oxygenated blood, we want to keep them separated, right? That way we make sure we're always feeding the maximum amount of oxygen to our muscles and our other cells. Here's what frogs do. They've got the right and left atria, right? So just like this, they're getting deoxygenated blood from the body, they're getting oxygenated blood from the lungs, but then kind of defeating the purpose, they dump it all into one, the only ventricle. Which means now we've got oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood all mixing together and just one big boop. And the one big boop is strong enough though that it pushes all the blood through the body twice, right? So it goes all through the body bloop and all through the body bloop and all through the body bloop and all through the body bloop. But again, is this a very efficient way of using a chambered heart? Yeah. No. Because we separated, no, it's bad, we separated the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, and then we just mixed it all back together, pumping semi-oxygenated, dirty blood all through the bloodstream. Um, but, how can they survive this? Because they can also do gas exchange through their skin. So in addition to having the lungs, they can also use their entire skin, their entire body as like a backup set of lungs. Oh, that's right? so, so, I mean, they kind of have to because, right, they're mixing that all together. But so it's like a trade-off, right? Like they have to stay wet so they can breathe through the skin. They have to breathe through the skin because they only have three chambers in their heart. But you can see like this is sort of like a beta version of a chambered heart. So again, we're looking at our evolutionary heritage, and they found it like a workaround, right? So they can still survive natural selection. That's why they still have it. To see these organ systems, you're going to get your friend, the frog. After you're done looking at its mouth, you're going to put it ventral side up. That's belly side up. Now, here's the thing. To see the, to see the parts of these frogs, we've got to cut them open. And to do that, you have to remember that they've been sitting in a bucket full of water. So when you cut them open, there's a good chance you're going to get some serious spray action, like right at your face. So to avoid, avoid getting frog water in your eyes, we're going to wear safety goggles. Not the glasses, but the goggles, until everyone has their frog open and has drained the water from the body cavity. Then we can all switch to safety glasses.
And they don't want to have another kid get frog juice in their eye. That's right, I said another. How many have there been? Too many. <laughs> now, to cut the frog open, this is what you're going to do. You take your forceps, you won't need the scalpel at all. In fact, it's not even going to be out tomorrow. You take your forceps, you pinch like right where you imagine the belly button would be, but remember, it lays eggs, no one will record. So you just, right there, just brit and pinch it up, and then make a little cut. And they're going to make what is called an eye incision. See that capital letter I? And on the first one, if you go below the arms, it's okay. But you see that's a capital letter I? Same thing that the, that the coroner would use to do an autopsy. Big, big capital letter I. Then you open up its skin like a pair of French doors. Now in humans, in humans right under the skin, that's where we store all our fat. Nice, squishy, insulating, keeping us warm, and storing a bunch of energy fat. And then we have the muscles on the inside. Frogs, you just open it up, boom, you're going to see the muscles because they don't store their fat between their skin and their muscles. Which means you'll see the full-on eight-pack of your frog as soon as you open up the squid. As soon as you open up the skin, and it's jacked. It's going to be awesome. In fact, its muscles look very similar to mine. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm not, I'm not joking, I'm being serious. You just can't see them because I've got the fat in between the muscle it's and the just skin. It's protection. Right? So in fact, yeah, it protects my muscles in case somebody were to try to punch me in the gut. I've got exactly. extra insulation here. Take that. You can't have it getting hurt. But, yeah. they, but they can't burn it off like us either? Wait for it. They just don't <laughs> store it there. They don't store it there. They store it somewhere else. Now, you're going to do that first cut. And then after you're done, and make sure you look at those blood vessels in the skin, right? See that, how it can do gas exchange. Then you're going to repeat the same thing. Grab with the forceps, give the old pincheroo, make a capital letter I again. This time go deeper, and this time go higher. Go above the arms. When you get right here, that's the breastplate, the sternum. You're going to have to break that with the scissors. It's going to crunch. It might take two hands. You're going to cut up here, and you're going to cut through a bunch of the ribs to get all this open. And when you open it, you've got, you got to be pretty forceful. Be careful because depending on how you cut it, some of these bones up here might be a little sharp. So make sure you get under them, not on them. Get under them with your thumbs. Pry it open. When you do that, you'll see this. Whoa. Uh, here's the internal anatomy of the frog. Now, first, do you see these little fingery things? Yeah. Those, those aren't, no, the ribs you cut already. Plus, this is down in the abdomen. That's their fat. So they store their fat in little finger-like projections inside their body cavity to insulate their organs directly. If you have a lot and it's in the way, it's kind of like banana peppers. No, I'm not done. You just pull them out of the way. Then, you're going to see the heart, right? You should see all three chambers of the heart. Two atria, nice big ventricle. See all this liver? You're going to remove the whole liver. Here's the liver partially removed. So you can see the lungs. See the lungs? Again, here's the heart. Notice that the two atria are different colors than the ventricle. You'll see the ventricle really well. If you don't see this, you didn't cut far enough. Below all that, you'll see the stomach, small intestine, then large intestine. Down here, this is where you find the urinary bladder. But remember, all that waste just goes in here. You're going to remove the entire digestive system. I don't know why you keep looking at your folders like I'm going to be done anytime soon. You're making it worse. You're going to remove the entire digestive system. Reason one, because we're going to cut, cut, and cut the stomach open. I want to see what's it been eating. Yeah. Also, once you remove the whole digestive system, the liver, underneath it, think lower back. This is where your kidneys are. Either side of your spine, lower back. We're looking for the kidneys. You cut them on the ventral side, dig everything out, find the kidneys. They literally look like kidney beans. Big, brown, flattened kidney beans. If you have a female, though, this whole thing's going to be full of eggs, and you're going to have to take all those out first. Oh, God. And then you'll see two little, like, ramen noodle-looking things on the sides. Those are the oviducts, where all those eggs will go out through the cloaca. If you have a male, you won't have any of that, but instead, you'll see two little, like, pinto bean-looking structures on top of the kidneys. That's the testes. Nice and safe inside the body cavity where no one could kick it. Lucky! Alright, what questions do you have about the frog? <laughs> I have a frog dissection video that I just put on the Schoology. I recommend you watch it before you come in tomorrow. And what kind of shoes are we going to need to have? Clothes! Clothes, clothes, push and chairs. Have a good day. Is there a way to tell if it's a male or female without cutting into them? No. Dang.